Well, good afternoon. Um, here we are, Talent War Group, episode 28, Earn Credibility Before Asserting Authority. Uh, today's discussion is going to be with me, Lisa Jaster. Um, background is very briefly, seven years active duty service, five year break in service, and I am about to hit nine years as a reserve officer, currently in battalion command. Um, also been doing a lot of work in an in various engineering firms since I left active service in 2007. Uh, with us, he'll give a more in-depth introduction of himself later on, is Mike Herzendorf, and he is a retired Army Special Operations Aviator and was also the Chief of Staff of the 82nd Airborne. So he has a lot of experience with regards to the military, um, but also we're going to delve into his experience transitioning from the military into corporate America. With us today, we also have Shay Bolden. Shay is a business development team member at EF Overwatch. Um, he's gonna be listening in on the conversation and at the end, we'll wrap up some key points that we make. Unless we don't make any, then he'll just uh, hang up and we'll hang our head in shame. So today is a conversation that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I have worked specifically as a engineer in the army and also as a project manager and program manager, as well as a construction manager in corporate America. And if you can tell from either looking at me here or seeing my profile anywhere, I don't necessarily walk onto a military or uh, oil and gas civilian construction site and command respect. So when you're in charge, whether it's being in charge of a team or in charge of a project site, there is something you need to do before you can just say, I'm in charge. And one of the things I want to point out is we do it uh, in the military, you have people that walk in with a certain rank and you allocate respect based on their rank, but that doesn't mean you listen to them and that you truly respect them. In corporate America, when somebody walks in, you don't really know their background. You don't know that, hey, they're a commissioned officer, they're a captain, so they have at least three years of service. You don't have that resume on them. And, and one of the things I wanna bring out today, and hopefully it'll come out in the conversation as well, is that you have failed with regards to earning credibility, if you start grabbing your collar in the military to display your rank, or in corporate America, you start spouting off your resume. And it's, it's one of those indicators to me when I had junior level managers, if they started saying, hey, you should listen to me because I've done X, Y, and Z, that's when I stop and say, okay, you haven't earned your credibility. If you feel obligated to say, hey, I'm the boss, you need to listen. That's that's kind of one of those failures that, that leads to this, we're asserting authority before we've earned credibility. 
So I've had a couple creative incidents that I'm gonna I'm gonna describe here just to kick off the discussion. For anyone who's listening, I want to point out the fact that you get to either listen to Mike and I talk or we can have a little bit more interactive dialogue if you put questions in the comments. And whether you're on Facebook or on um, LinkedIn Live or any other platform watching this podcast, you can type in your questions. If they don't get answered during this actual discussion, we can go back and, and talk about them either in vlogs or blogs or even it, your questions might kick off another discussion. So the first story I want to tell you is that of poor little second Lieutenant Peplinski. Now, for anybody who has military experience, you already understand how this works. But for me, I joined an engineer platoon as a brand new platoon leader commissioned six months earlier in the United States Army as an engineer officer. And I was walking in to take my first platoon. That platoon had been together for years already. The platoon sergeant, who was ultimately supposed to report to me and be my right-hand man, had 18 years in uniform. And here I had six months since my commissioning. And I am in, I am in charge, I am responsible, and I'm supposed to be giving direction and instruction to, to my platoon. Um, you can't walk in and assert authority. And, and anyone who can visualize that scenario understands that if you're looking at somebody who's worked 18 years in the industry and you've been in the industry for six months and all of that time being um, training, you can't walk in and say, hey, this is how things are done. And one of the things, one of the lessons I learned with that very first platoon was that my soldiers, whether they had been in the military for a year or 18 years, understood that I was in charge, understood that my position meant that I had the final say in not only what we were doing, but how we were doing it. But they were really looking at me to see how I was going to earn that credibility first. Luckily for me, being in an engineer unit and actually doing um, horizontal construction, so roadways, et cetera, I had a degree in civil engineering. So I already had some credibility as soon as everyone understood that I, I had actually studied the field we were working in for four years. But I still didn't have that credibility as a soldier. And, and for me, I had to do some creative things because again, I don't look like I should be in charge of a military construction site. When I walk on, I was the smallest soldier in my platoon. Um, and again, I was, I was probably one of the younger ones and green, very green. And how I earned credibility was by demonstrating to my soldiers that soldiering mattered to me, not just engineering, not just the academics, not just the books, but actual soldiering. And the way I did it and, and this is not how everyone can do it, but there was ropes in our company area where we did our physical fitness training and I decided to do legless rope climbs. I did them in such a way that the soldiers could see me, but they weren't looking at me. I obviously wasn't trying to get attention, but I wanted them to notice that as a combat engineer with these hard charging soldiers that I respected physicality and I was looking at the whole soldier and I did that. I earned that credibility by demonstrating my proficiency in something that wasn't expected. Now, that's one way. And then there's another way. And this is transitioning that same concept into corporate America. So when I left active service in 2007, I was put in a variety of project management roles. Well, a couple of years ago, I decided to leave my large corporate job and take over as a senior level manager. And I had six, six managers under me. And my very first week, I scheduled uh, at least an hour long meeting with each of my six managers so that I could build rapport with them. And one of the reasons I did that is because I wanted to know how each manager needed to be led, but also how they needed to be communicated with. So part of earning credibility is, is being able to read your people and understand not only what they're thinking, but how they're thinking. 
And during one of those six initial interviews, I, I had one of my managers come up to me and say, yeah, well, people are asking me why I just didn't take your job. This brings up a huge discussion point because as an external hire, as the new guy, it's hard for people to, to understand why aren't we hiring from within? Are you here to, to make cuts? Is there going to be some sort of major upheaval of our existing? Are you, as the new manager, supposed to fall in line with what's existing? Or are you an agent of change? And, and so there's a high level of uncomfort uncomfort. And there's also a lot of potential clashing. So, so what I did, of course, this, this comment, this question took me completely off guard. But I also took a quick note to understand that this manager was going to be a perfect mirror. If I had an issue, a problem, a concern, I could go to this manager and say, hey, What's the hubbub at the water cooler? And, and that helps me earn credibility with them to understand how they communicate as well as understand um, that they, they didn't have any filters. So um, I'm starting off with those short stories and then I wanna actually transition to Mike because he has a different experience. Um, first, Mike, I'd like you to introduce yourself a little bit better than I did. I didn't give you the full, um, full pump and circumstance that you deserve with 29 years of active duty service. But then I would like you to address my first big question to you is with 29 years of service entering corporate America, you have a lot of credibility, but how do you show that to people who, who don't know anything about your military background? So um, Mike, I'm handing it off to you. Hey, thanks, Lisa. And boy, I'll tell you, I love listening to your stories because I learned something every time. And you brought out so many good points. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I spent uh, 29 years in the Army, uh, Special Operations Aviator, worked at uh, Chief of Staff, the 2nd Airborne Division. But, uh, you know, really all that means was I, I, I had a lot of great soldiers and I was honored to serve. You know, I, I re retired in 2018 and uh, took a step into the nonprofit space, which is, is still corporate America, but, you know, it has some peculiarities. But, you know, Lisa, I found myself in exactly many of the same situations as, as being a second lieutenant again. You have a background that some people understand, some may not, um, but how do you earn their respect? And the first thing is absolutely what you said. It has to be earned. Uh, it's not going to be given because your title, they know you're the boss, but you have to earn it. And I think that the way you do that is, is via being that servant leader. You have to show the people uh, that you are working with, that you're a team, and that you're there to serve them in their best interest and ultimately the best interests uh, of the organization. You know, if the organization is successful, a successful business, that's going to be successful employees. I mean, they're, they're synonymous with each other. And so I, uh, I stepped out and I was briefly... Uh, um, sort of a chief of staff of a, a UAS company. And then within about five months, I found myself as the, the CEO. And I was promoted uh, to be the CEO over about 10 other people who had experience there, uh, years and years of industry experience, but it was based on leadership. And, and I really think that was just about, uh, one, willing to do the hard jobs and put in the effort, because regardless of where you are in the military corporate world, everybody knows it's a lot of work. And I was I was ready to to listen and learn from them, uh, and I think that's really the the you know the number one takeaway point. You know, as as Lisa, then you said uh, you had your mirror image in the organization. I think that's incredibly correct. I looked out of those employees, who could I use as a mentor? Who is going to give me uh, that unvarnished truth about the organization, about history of things? You know, before I stepped on a landmine and about you know, how I approach things. And so, I, you know, I've heard them called telescopes and microscopes. Microscopes help you look in, telescopes help you look out. But but find that trusted agent who you could talk with and bounce ideas off of that is just as vested as you are in the organization. And, you know, I think really the other thing is, is promoting that team attitude. You know, the, the military and the Army is, is the, the world's best team sport. 
And I see a lot of that in corporate America. Uh, and I've seen also where, where it's not as prevalent in corporate America. And I think as you can build a team, you know, create that team uh, that sees things the way you see them, even though, you know, they may have different views, you, you all want to be headed towards that, that North Star. And that they are just as committed to you uh, for accomplishment of the goals of the organization. So I, I think, you know, those are really the, the sort of the key points. And I, I think you, you have fantastic stories there, Lisa. Thanks, Mike. I'm actually going to pick up something real quick. Um, we're already getting some comments. So thank you for those dialing in. Uh, Neil Mack makes a point. It's He has three bullet points. It's the second one. Um, but he wrote, by showing respect for existing leaders on my team and expressing how important they are to me. So this brought up uh, a very personal situation, which was in this last career change that I made, the position I got, there were people who expected to be sitting in that chair to the point where they had planned what they were gonna hang on the walls and, and they didn't get that opportunity. So now I have not only my most senior leaders within the organization, the people I need for success um, with a little bit of bitterness, but I'm wondering, Mike, maybe you have some tools and techniques. I don't know if I did it right, but the, the way to show respect for what they already know while still maintaining the authority. So um, I've got a saying that I give to my junior leaders more in the military than in, in corporate America, but that's, you can always back down, you can never back uh, ramp it up. So for me, again, um, I, I joke a lot. My husband's six foot nine, he's 260 pounds. He walks into a room, he even slightly raises his voice. People feel like he's yelling. Well, I slightly raise my voice. I sound like a chihuahua attacking the mailman. It's just, it's, it's not the same tools and techniques. I, I can't use those. And um, so I've, I've always been challenged with, how do I continue to assert that authority when I'm supposed to have it? But in this case, not only have I not yet earned my credibility, but it was somebody else thought they should be sitting in my seat. So what I did is I tried quite a bit to incorporate them in the decision-making process, which I think is effective, but there was also a really fine line of, if I ask them for help too much, then they feel like, oh, well, I really should have gotten that job and Lisa is not capable and should not. It almost undermines your credibility if you involve those, those people who thought that they were supposed to get your job. Mike, I'm wondering if you have any recommendations or experiences with regards to how do you, how do you deal with earning credibility from, with people who thought that they were best seated, suited for your seat? Yeah, Lisa, it's funny because I had that exact same situation. And, uh, you know, the way I approach that is one person at a time. You have those one on one conversations uh, where you can just discuss and listen to what they think. And then I think the art of asking questions, how do you challenge um, their assumptions, their facts? How do you challenge the consensus of what they're thinking about? But I think you do it one on one um, where you know, you give them that that opportunity to sort of maybe vent, sort of just let it get out of them. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you realize you were put in that position for a reason and that person wasn't. Um, and, and I think you have to you try to get that person on your team, but it, it's done one person at a time. And that's how I think you, you start to build that team. Mike, it's funny that you say the one person at a time, because whether it is proving myself I just started doing jujitsu again. I've had, I've had two shoulder surgeries. This one has to be replaced in the next five years, you know, used and abused the body. So I just got back on the jujitsu mats and, you know, it, it's not the same as business, but it is a direct correlation. I walk in, I'm super impressive being 140 pounds. And I go now because of my schedule, I can go to the eight or nine o'clock class in the morning. So it's all law enforcement who works second shift. So the smallest guy in the room is five, nine, 210 pounds. And, 
and I have to prove that, no, you don't have to go light with me. I have to prove that I know what I'm doing one person at a time. Now, that's a very physical example, but it's it's very it's a very tactile explanation of the theoretical um, statement you just made. Um, that one person at a time. And I think that actually ties right into the question we have here from Lexi Little. Um, she asks, uh, she says, I'm commissioning in May into the Army Aviation. So right up your alley, Mike. And I'm nervous about taking leadership with so little experience. Advice for second lieutenants. And I really do want to throw this at you because as a brand new aviator, that's different than me taking calculations and understanding um, forces and stresses. Uh, it's it's a whole different world. So, Mike, I'm going to throw this directly at you. Yeah. Hey, hey thanks, Lisa. You know, b before I answer that question, and I could probably talk for, you know, a couple of weeks on it. Uh, one of the most important traits of leadership, and, and this is really what we're talking about, right? We're talking about leadership. We're just talking in, in a specific situation, transitioning and, you know, coming into roles as, uh, as a, maybe a manager. But I want to tell you right now, one of the most important characteristics is humility, a, a modest view of one's importance. And for everyone who's listening to this, Lisa is one of the most humble people you will ever meet. She is, is portrayed herself as a small, um, you know, little person who speaks like Ochawa. Lisa is one of the, the baddest people on this planet, graduate of the Army's Ranger School and uh, an extremely fit athlete. So I, I point out her humility because it would do injustice if we did not talk about, uh, you know, her, her strengths as a human being. So great question. You know, what do you do as a second lieutenant in aviation? You know, really, really that it's not any different. You have to learn. The, the challenge is it's a very, very technical field and you're going to have more um, responsibilities put on you that are probably anything but being an aviator. And so you're really going to have to find that time on your own to study uh, and to take very serious your progression as an aviator, because if you want to be a, a senior leader uh, in aviation, the army, you have to achieve some of those you know, important gates of being a pilot in command, the ability to fly that aircraft on your own in any environment. And it's also, as Lisa said, the ability, you know, to know what your soldiers are tasked to doing. So, uh, you know, once again, it is about listening and learning. And, uh, you know, I am on LinkedIn uh, for, for uh, let me see who asked that question. Please feel, feel free to reach out to me and we can have a dialogue specific to, to aviation. But at the end of the day, you listen, you learn, you find that mentor who's probably a senior warrant officer and uh, when in charge, be in charge, but really do your best to, to promote the team and listen to everyone else. And Lexi, I'm going to add on to what Mike already said, and that's um, connecting with your soldiers is so critical, but it's kind of like my story about the legless rope climb. Although we would love to connect in our field of focus, the way we want to connect isn't necessarily the way those that are going to be working for us need us to connect because they do need to feel like you're a credible leader. And um, caring, demonstrating care is actually a very easy process in today's society where we have um, a computer in our hands at all times um, to, to give a story because it's easier to explain through a story. Um, when I would fly offshore, I had all of these deep water drilling guys who lived offshore for two weeks at a time, went to, back to their families for two weeks and then went out again. I would come out to check on my projects. We would have seven o'clock in the morning, uh, shift change, project progress calls and they heard my voice, but never saw me. So when I would go out to the platform, I had a very short period of time where I got to expand on their knowledge of me and make them feel like I cared about something other than their productivity. And, and what I found as a leader is people are extremely productive if they think you care. So again, earning getting that foot in the door is sometimes more about demonstrating that you care because they already know what knowledge you have. As a second lieutenant, you've, you've graduated your Bullock, you have 
you know, a college degree, they, they know your academic experience. Now they need to know that you're going to be there for them when the times are rough because the military is 24 seven as, as we know. So one of the things I did for my offshore guys is I brought them updated newspapers, brought them magazines, and then I would read something that I knew they were all interested in. So a lot of these guys built muscle cars in their garage for the two weeks they were off. So I learned a little bit about carburetors and I learned a little bit about um, various engines and um, American muscle. American muscle cars are the thing in the oil and gas field. And I probably know more than I should, but now I like the Fast and Furious series because of it. <laughs> but learning about, learn, um, being able to have connecting topics will help you break into some of these water cooler discussions. And at that point in time, your soldiers will get to know you. And once they get to know you, then they get to trust you, you earn that credibility, and then you can assert authority, even if you're only a second lieutenant. Um, so hopefully that's helpful, Lexi. I'm gonna transition over to something that Jessica Dennis said very early in our conversation, just a couple minutes in. Um, and what she said in here that kind of hit me hard was keeping the laws of combat poster at my desk has been a tremendous source of encouragement while also being a physical reminder of my duties as an employee to help the team win. The reason why I really like that with regards to our topic of earn credibility before asserting authority is you are constantly being judged in those first couple of days. And, and your first days, weeks, and then later on months is when you either earn that credibility or you lose it. And once you lose it, it's really hard to get it back. So I, I'm going to pose this question to Mike as well, but the, the question I want to ask is what do you do in your office? What do you do with regards to presentation? You have the big corner office upstairs and, and you're going to bring things in. And I will say the one thing that I do is I make sure I bring something in. One, because I'm the new guy, I need to make sure it looks like I'm here to stay. Like my focus is this organization, so I'm going to make this room a home. I also, which is a complete change for 43-year-old Lisa versus 23-year-old Lisa, I bring in personal items. Once upon a time, it was the, I have Teddy Roosevelt's um, Man in the Arena because I find that highly motivating. I have a cab saber. There's a story behind that. I have a kukuri, so I have some weapons. I have some animal heads that I bring in, but then I now make sure I bring in pictures of my kids and my husband, and, and I'll actually get into that later after I throw this over to Mike, because um, I have another point I wanna bring up, but I bring in some of those personal items so that people remember, not only am I here to stay, but I'm here to be part of this group, which means I wanna grab a beer after work, I want us to go to lunch, I wanna be available and open, so the question I'm throwing to you, Mike, is what do you do to kind of um, open yourself up or present the version of yourself that you want your employees to see? Yeah, no, that, that's a, a great story. So, the, so when I, I've, you know, had two jobs uh, since I retired from the military, and both of them were dramatically different. So the first one, uh, you know, I wondered about that, right? Because in the military, if you're a senior officer and list or senior NCO, you, you have an office. And a lot of times you put uh, previous gifts that were given to you in the military on the wall. And it's, it's almost like people could see what you've done. Well, the first thing I did was I looked at what everybody else had uh, in the organization. What did they put on their desks? What did they have on the walls? Uh, and that would be the first thing I would tell anyone is to look at what uh, the cultural norms are of the organization you're going into, because, um, you know, you may have a different view and you wouldn't want to do something different to inadvertently uh, try to send one message of, you know, I, I'm a, a family oriented people person when it could send, you know, the exact opposite just based on how everyone else in the organization behaves. I uh, specifically did not take an office um, when, when I first joined the organization. It, it was relatively small and there was a number of offices with sort of a, a main common area. And, and I purposely, uh, you know, set up a standing desk, you know, out in the open area to show that, okay, even though I was, you know, the head of the staff, uh, that 
I was just there to do the work of the organization. And I think that earned uh, me a little bit of credibility, you know, right from the get go that, you know, one, I'm going to look at things differently. I'm just not going to settle in to, to an office and, and do those normal things. Uh, I took a stand and desk just right out in front of everybody. And it showed that, hey, I'm accessible and open to everyone here. And I will always, you know, take my time before my work to, to help others. You know, the, the other challenge, I think, is how is that going to change in the virtual world? Right. Right now, you can see I'm at my home office. I'm standing in an apartment, you know, at, at a counter in, in the kitchen. So I think, you know, I'll put it right back to you, Lisa. How is it going to change in a virtual world that building those relationships and letting people see you and understand you and just have those offhanded conversations? Because you're right. Right. What do we do? We get on Zoom and we get right to the meeting. There's often very little chatter or discussion about, you know, hey, Lisa, I see that picture in, in back of you. Why don't you tell me about that? Whereas if, if you were in person, it's much more natural because you're going to be next to someone you're going to talk to them. In the virtual world, you know, sometimes you just stare at that screen and wait for someone else to talk. So there's, a, there's two examples. I'll let you comment back on, on how you do it in the virtual world, Lisa. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's a whole new can of worms. Thanks. <laughs> um, you know, recently I, I belong to all sorts of various groups. So whether it's um, Lean In, which is Sheryl Sandberg, and it's, it's very geared towards professional women or, you know, conservative and liberal chat groups. I, I kind of, ban or span all of the different um, demographics, I guess, mostly because I find it interesting and I don't fit in any one category and I never have. But Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In organization recently had an entire series of articles about the negative impact of Zoom on professional development for, for certain demographics. Specifically, meaning I can dress as nice as I want, come to work, talk, uh, you know, I can really church it up when all you see is the nine to five version of Lisa Jaster. But as soon as I turn on my camera, now you're seeing the fact that I haven't hung my pictures this way. I haven't hung my pictures on the wall. If you, um, you turn it the other way, you'll see I've got a broken grandfather clock that I inherited a few years ago and just haven't gotten around to fixing it. And, and suddenly you're being brought completely into my life, my home life. If I have a kid or a dog or something running across the background, suddenly that's part of my work environment where that never, that was never seen unless I wanted it to be seen. So there's a negative impact of um, potentially opening my home to my coworkers. There's also a potential positive impact where I could make my background look like whatever I wanted it to. Um, and then there's that third impact that you just talked about, Mike, which is getting those interpersonal relationships or building those interpersonal relationships are difficult and sometimes maybe even impossible. And, and how do you navigate that? So kind of using a really long way to restate the question to see if I can come up with an answer, but I. I don't know. Um, so because I do like social media um, and I say that a little tongue in cheek because I love reading. I don't necessarily like going out there and, and getting involved in any of these debates and discussions, but I do like following as a battalion commander. I follow all my company commanders. I see what they post. I get to know them a little bit. Um, I find text messaging uh, such a great way to be in somebody's space without invading someone's space. So for every work group I have, I have a group text and I will very consciously once a week send a group text, maybe send a meme. Um, I hate to say it, but when those uh, Sanders memes were coming out after the inauguration with the mittens, I probably sent a hundred of those out. I thought they were absolutely fantastic. Um, Maybe that says a little too much about me, but finding ways to network, I think, in the virtual world is is probably a great way to demonstrate that you want to be a leader and that you want to be a manager. So I think just the 
the effort, if somebody puts forth the effort, they will start to gain some sort of credibility. Um, on the other side, I would say, when you are doing these Zooms, put something in the background and, and make it a little personal. Personal if it's those tight group of employees, if it's your managers, if you're, if you're briefing a team and it's 30 people, they don't need to see your family pictures in the back. But I had, I had one friend, a very good friend of mine now, but one of the reasons we became friends is in his background, he had a picture of him and his three sons in a bathtub behind his desk. I'm like, you, you realize you have that? And he said, yes, specifically because now you're going to ask me about my kids. And now you're also going to know that if I'm comfortable enough to let everybody on this call see a picture of me in a bathtub with my kids, I'm probably pretty approachable. And I thought that was a really good, not a tactic I would use, but a very good tactic. Um, Mike, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually kind of loop in another topic uh, in, about overworking. So with regards to earning your credibility, specifically the earning part, I fail quite frequently in being overly connected, overly available. I wanna be, if it's a brick and mortar office, I wanna be one of the first people in there because I like to greet people in the morning, have my cup of coffee, take my time actually starting to work. But because I'm there before other people, I don't find that first 15 minutes of the day, I don't think about it being work. Um, so I don't think about it, but I also like to see when people leave. I like to, I don't like employees who work for me to be there too much later than, than I am because there is definitely guilt associated with that. Um, you know, I, I want to, I want to manage. So how do you, how do you still give that authority position um, management without being an overworker? Cause what happens is when the manager works late, then everybody starts working later. If the manager comes in early, then everybody starts coming in earlier. Um, Mike, I'm, I'm curious how you manage that perception. Yeah, no, you know, one, I'm not sure I did, did it very well because, um, you know, uh, I think one of my strengths was I was just willing to put in the hours required. Uh, but as you get older, you realize you really have to strike that work-life balance. And, and I think one of the, the best things to do uh, is to focus as that manager or leader on the important versus the urgent. I absolutely agree, Lisa. It's good to get in early, greet people, uh, get yourself settled. But it's probably equally important to leave at a reasonable hour to show your employees that you know there is work-life balance because you don't want to get them burned out. Because in the end, that doesn't do anybody good. So uh, I really tried to manage that by managing my calendar. And the less that I did, the more that I did. The less that I put on the calendar and focused to those really important priorities the more that I got done and it prevented me uh, from overworking. Great advice. Um, so we actually received two questions that are kind of similar. Um, I'm gonna first read Eric's and then I'm gonna read Scott's. And I think, um, I think we can answer both of them to some degree. So Eric Britz asked, have you ever been placed into a toxic environment and as a new leader of a dysfunctional team, can you describe how you handled it? Now, I wanna answer that question, but then Scott puts a very interesting twist, which the toxic environment and um, Scott's question are one and the same for me, which is the reason why I'm reading them both. So Scott Miller said, what is your recommendation to walking into a known toxic organization that is resistance, resistant to change? This includes the C-suite continuing to want to do business as a small business when they have graduated to a large. Um, so both are questions about toxic environments. Um, but the second one, the, the small business or the large business that's still operating as a small business um, is, is another challenge. So I would, I would first answer this question by saying the toxic environment can be changed, but it can't be changed easily, especially if the toxicity is coming from above you. 
So um, actually another, another topic I, I really want to discuss again on a different day, because it's an entirely new can of worms is about managing up. Like how, how do you change your supervisors? And I think, I think the, there's a wrong way to do this. And, and the answer to both of these questions that I have was the wrong way. So I'm, I'm kind of looking for Mike for some guidance on maybe there's a better way to do this, but the wrong way I did it is I tried to be the intermediate. I tried to almost defend um, and protect those that were below me from those that were over me. And, and that was a horrible fail. So for both Eric and Scott, don't do that because what happens is you as a leader get completely exhausted and you spend all of your energy almost translating. I had a, a supervisor, a, a senior level supervisor over me tell a manager, one of my managers, hey, you can work on your vacation, it's fine. What that manager heard was my time off isn't respected. This is part of my benefits package. I should be able to walk away. I completely understood what that senior leader was trying to say. And what they were trying to say is, hey, listen, I know you're on vacation. This is really important. Can you spend an hour on a conference call or, or spend a little bit of time on this and, and figure out a way to maybe leave early before you go on vacation or come back a little bit late? Or, and, and that's really the message that I translated but because it was direct from from the toxic leader to to the employee it was it was taken really hard and and again i was trying to protect them so i'm not sure if if you have any good tools for this i know that i personally have failed at it a couple of times um I don't know, Mike. <laughs> Do you have an answer to these questions? This is a big challenge for me. It is. So I'm going to I'm going to sort of break it down as I, as I read Scott's question. You know, the the first part about toxic organizations. Okay, I think the first thing if you if you're in a toxic organization is you have to understand why. I think too often, you know, we look to jump to solutions when we really don't understand the root causes of the problem. You know, is it a singular individual? Is it multiple individuals? Is it just a certain business unit? So really understand um, what is the root cause of the problem. And then, you know, the first thing in any sort of toxic or, or challenging interpersonal uh, dynamic relationship is I try to look at things from that person's point of view, you know, walk in their shoes. What does it look like through their lens? Maybe, you know, how they're communicating or what they're portraying um, is not intentionally meant to come off as toxic. It's just, you know, sort of their, their operating practice. It could be perceived differently um, by someone on the outside. Uh, you know, a lot of, you know, organizations now have some form of performance reviews. And uh, I think trying to incorporate a 360 uh, kind of feedback into performance reviews is very healthy for organizations. And so that, that would be one area that you know, you could almost sort of look at in the HR department of how do you incorporate some form of 360 review or, or feedback to get to the get to certain leaders to, hey, you know, maybe we have a challenge here that we can fix. The, the second part of that, I, I sort of want to break out because he talks, Scott talks about uh, um, an organization that is resistant to change. And, and I'm sort of separating those because I'm making an assumption that, you know, just because you're resistant to change doesn't necessarily mean you're a toxic organization. And, and I guess that the question I would ask there is, is why are they resistant to change? Are they happy with the, the niche market that they're in? Um, is that leader just comfortable and not looking to expand or scale, not looking for increased challenges? Um, but, but I don't necessarily see an organization resistant to change and, and a toxic environment as being synonymous. Great points, Mike. Um, you know, something I wanted to, that kind of came in the back of my brain was a vlog that Mike Sorelli, one of the authors of The Talent War, uh, put out a few weeks back. I'm trying to look for, it was about three weeks ago. And he did a video with regards to micromanaging versus intrusive leadership. And 
I thought that was really good because I started second guessing some of my previous managers who I thought, well, maybe they were micromanagers. And had I led up a little bit more, I would have found out that they were just intrusive leaders. And intrusive leaders, although it sounds bad, is actually really good. That's a leader who's trying to figure out what's going on with you and what your thought patterns are so that they are aligned. Um, So sometimes what you consider a toxic environment might not be, but once you've earned your credibility and and really gotten your foot in the door, you should be able to hopefully kind of confront those managers and leaders and say, Hey, what are you looking for here? What, why are, is it a trust issue or are you trying to get alignment and, and lead up the chain of command again? Um, Impacting toxic leadership is, is always going to be a challenge because again, it depends on why that leader is toxic. Um, This is actually um, a fantastic discussion. We're already at the 45 minute mark. So what I want to do is I really want to get Mike's final thoughts, but We've had a lot of really good comments, so I'm going to throw it out there one more time. Just because we're done talking here, we have someone in the background who's collecting your questions, and I am taking a note that I need to I need to ponder a little bit more the discussion on toxic leadership um, and and growth. Because uh, another bad thing I did was I handed I handed my managers books like self help books about. Uh, how to grow the business or when to transition small businesses into larger businesses and, and some, some books that I thought if they read, it would help them. Not, not well advised by the way. So I'm going to give it to Mike for final thoughts. And then after that, Shay, I'd love to hear the points that you got out of our discussion, Mike. Yeah. Hey, hey Lisa, really great stories. And, and you know what, what you hit at by giving them, the, giving them those books is trying to get them ideas that they could then take as their own to implement. And and that goes to show, you know, really once again, your humility, you know, you don't care how the job gets done and who gets credit and you can get a lot done when you don't care who takes credit. So I I applaud you for that, Lisa. You know, I I think it was a great discussion and it really comes back to some some simple things. You got to go in there, you know, listening, right? Two ears, one mouth. You got to listen. You got to learn. And you got to show people you care. John Maxwell, you know, great books on leadership says people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think you you hit on that, Lisa. And, you know, show everyone that you appreciate them. You recognize the work that they're doing and you encourage them. And, you know, you can do that for free. Right. It's just kind words and and that humility, kind words, listening, learning will will go a long way in in accomplishment of the organization's objectives and, and showcasing the kind of leader that you are. Thanks, Lisa. Sure. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Glad to be here just to uh, give a brief introduction on who I am. I'm with uh, EF Overwatch, been on the operations team and now uh, moving into business development, but really taking a lot away from this discussion today. But to summarize that, uh, starting with, with some of Mike's points here, talking about the goal of being a servant leader and accomplishing that by listening to your people, aiming to learn, understand what's going on and really the organizational history and having situational awareness there and accomplishing that by finding a trusted agent and taking it one person at a time. That, that kind of goes into what Lisa was saying earlier on about, um, building understanding through having one-on-ones with her, with her team individually, and then kind of overcoming the challenges as well. When there are other people who think that they could have and should have earned your position and, you know, dealing with them leading when you need to. And uh, actually Mike, I'm glad you brought up the, the point of John C. Maxwell's book, the five levels of leadership. I was actually going to reference that as well. So the at the very beginning of the discussion, Lisa, you were mentioning the the uh, leadership based on rank or the credibility based on rank, and that's kind of like the lowest level of leadership talked about in that book, uh, like position or rights, and then moving up to the goal of uh, actually being respected and, and establishing the credibility. So I think that um, has some parallels here to what we've been discussing. 
And I, I saw somewhere along the way, the quote of this is how things have been done. And uh, the, the organizations that are resistant to change and, you know, you can't go in immediately and start trying to change things. So one of the big takeaways was like really understanding not only the, uh, you could say the microscope of what's going on with each individual, but also the, the telescope of uh, the whole situation and really f figuring out the organization and the new leader's place in it. Shay, those are all great points. Um, I will have to say, for those of you who haven't watched a whole lot of the Talent War Group um, podcasts, is it is a competition of how much the uh, listening leader quotes you. And it looks like, Mike, you definitely won today. <laughs> so Shay was a little, little mic heavy. So, well, there we go. I guess I owe you a beer. Um, before we go, I just want to shamelessly promote the Judberg podcast. Uh, it's Talent War Group is launching it this week. Tomorrow is supposed to be our first episode. Uh, it's it's a podcast where it's anchored by Fran Rachapi, and he's a Talent War Group member. Extremely well spoken um, and also quite a character. Um, Let's see, it says, in each episode, Fran has the in-depth discussion with trailblazers who have earned success through dedication to talent development, preparation, introspection, and the drive to get things done. Um, it's on Apple Podcasts. Like I said, the first episode is going live tomorrow. The authors of all of our favorite book and, and also our bosses in, in this endeavor, Mike and George, are the first guests that Fran will have on, again, launching tomorrow. So that's the Jedberg podcast on Apple Podcasts. And then if you like listening to these podcasts, our next one will be um, next week, Thursday, and it's titled, Mike Sorelli is going to be chairing it. It's titled, Leaders Should Not Be Outshined by Their Followers. Um, on top of all that, if you like any of the speakers, if you're following our blogs and our vlogs, please go to our website. You can book us for events. Um, share our information, the entire premise behind the talent war and the talent war group is to help companies become better, manage talent better. Um, we're, we're really here for you. So, so reach out to us, uh, follow us on LinkedIn or your other social media sites and guys and gals that were listening. Thank you so much for the comments. These discussions are so much better when you're part of them. So I appreciate it. And I hope you got something out of today's discussion. Thank you.